Good afternoon or evening. I'm Paula Romaley, Vice Chair of the Russian American Business and Culture Council, the organizer of this event. We're very glad to welcome over 300 people here today from Russia, the United States, and elsewhere across the world. We're here to mark the 161st anniversary of the date of the birth of the great Russian writer Anton Pavlovich Chekhov. Some of you may know that Chekhov leapt to literary fame at the tender age of just 28, or that he later went on to help establish the famous Moscow Art Theater. Most people in the West know him for his plays, plays that are still performed around the world, masterpieces like The Cherry Orchard, Three Sisters, Uncle Vanya, and of course, The Seagull. But it was Chekhov's short stories that originally made him famous in Russia, and they're still very popular all around the world, especially with writers. And that's, I think, because Chekhov is ultimately a writer's writer in the best sense of that term. And his stories still influence contemporary literature no less than his plays have shaped modern theater. Chekhov died when he was young, tragically young, at just 44 but he lived a rich and colorful life that's no less interesting than his stories. And today, we'll celebrate both with the help of two terrific speakers. First, we have Professor Donald Rayfield. In the 1990s, Dr. Rayfield used material in newly Russian, opened Russian archives to produce his critical study of Chekhov's work and acclaimed biography entitled Anton Chekhov, A Life. He is Professor Emeritus of Russian and Georgian at Queen Mary University of London. He is the author of many books and articles on contemporary and comparative literature and other topics. He's also the award-winning author of many translations of poetry and prose. And in recognition of his many achievements in 2003, he was awarded the Order of the British Empire. And in 2016, he was awarded the Order of Merit by the Georgian government. We're also happy to have with us Beth Gilliland. Beth, sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty here. Um, Beth is a writer, performer, and teacher at the Interact Center for the Visual and Performing Arts in Minneapolis. Before that, she was a longtime company member of Dudley Riggs Brave New Workshop, one of the oldest political satire theaters in the US. She's also been a voice actress on national public radio programs, including A Prairie Home Companion, Good Evening with Noah Adams, as well as on Minnesota Public Radio. Our thanks to you both for being here. We're gonna start off the program with remarks from Professor Rayfield, followed by dramatic readings of two Chekhov short stories performed by Beth Gilliland. And then we'll move to an audience Q&A. You can submit your questions or comments at any time during the program, simply by hovering your cursor at the bottom of the screen and, and clicking the Q&A button or the chat box. Of course, if you don't wanna be distracted by either of these boxes, you can simply close them and then reopen them later uh, in the latter part of the program. One last tech tip, if you wanna change your screen view, hover your cursor over the right-hand corner of your screen and click view and then the side-by-side -side speaker option. This lets you adjust the slideshow and speaker window side. Lastly, before we dive in, I'd like to thank our program co-sponsors, the Museum of Russian Art in Minneapolis, Global Minnesota, and Russian Media of Minnesota. And thanks especially to everyone here for joining us. And now, with great pleasure and relief, I yield the speaker's tile to Professor Rayfield, and hopefully our tech problems have been resolved. Welcome, Professor Rayfield. Thank you very much. Um, Jack have only lived 44 years, but they were absolutely packed with events and complications. 
Uh, and it all starts in 1860 when he was born in a little place called Taganrok, which is not very important today. It's sort of east of the Crimea, a port which is not used much because it's now too shallow for modern ships. A most unusual place, however, because although it, had, it was small, it had an opera house, it had a theater, it had a big Italian commercial community, it had Greeks, it had Czechs, it had even Scotsmen. Uh, it was a very lively place. And um, Czech was, began, in fact, unlike most Russian writers of the time, for, not from the top as a member of the gentry, but from the bottom. His grandfather had been a serf who taught himself to read and write and accumulated enough money to buy his freedom and freedom for his children, except for one daughter whom he left as a serf. Um, and then uh, Czech's father, was the sort of father I think you probably need to be a great writer. Dickens had this sort of father, Ibsen had this sort of father, a failed businessman. For some reason, it's a great inspiration. A shopkeeper who kept on selling at a loss and uh, persisting uh, all the same in uh, expanding. He was also a very religious man uh, and um, Jacob remembered a childhood in which he had to kneel uh, on cold stone floors at three in the morning to uh, get the Easter service ready. His father was a choir, amateur choir master as well. And that affects him much, uh, uh, very much in later life. He, he knew religion extremely well and he had no faith whatsoever. It all dis disappeared. Now, the Chekhov siblings, uh, as you see, were quite numerous. Uh, his two elder brothers were in their own way geniuses. Um, they had character defects and addictions which prevented them from realizing themselves. And Anton as the third member was somehow the golden mean. He was, had the strength of character uh, to resist most of his addictions, to know what he wanted to do and to go ahead and do it. Um, it was a fairly di dysfunctional family all the same. His, his mother could never, manage in any crisis. Uh, there was constant moving from house to house. And finally, uh, they had to uh, flee to Moscow, uh, not all at once, but in, in different ways. Taganrok, however, gave him an extraordinarily good education. It had a, a very fine classical school. Um, and he learned some Latin, he learned some Greek, he learned a little French and German. Chekhov had no, no talent for, for languages, however. Uh, but the teachers himself, themselves were great influences. Um, in some ways, they were tragic. Uh, if you go to Taganrok Cemetery, you can see what haunted Chekhov in his dreams, the graves of his teachers. They came to sad ends. Uh, some of them were writers. Uh, one of them even wrote Chekhov stories in advance of Chekhov, and Chekhov was uh, influenced by him. Um, so he, he had an extraordinarily good education for a small provincial town. He saw his Shakespeare at the theater. He saw all the Italian operas, even though schoolboys were not supposed to go to the theater. And um, he, he had a wide irrigation in, in many other ways. Uh, the town brothel was run by a star pupil from the grammar school. So no doubt that was a, a very precocious sexual education as well. And um, he did well enough at school to get a scholarship, which meant that he could go to Moscow and study at the university. Now, if you were like Chekhov, son of a merchant, you wanted to become a gentleman. A gentleman in Russia was free from military service, free from flogging. He could move anywhere he liked. He would get a foreign passport. And the best way was to get a university degree. And medicine was the, the one that was most in demand and the one that didn't discriminate against poorer pupils. And so he went to Moscow, Moscow, uh, Moscow University Medical School and it's a surprising fact that in Russia, uh, medicine was, surprising, uh, was extremely advanced. The only problem was that there just weren't enough doctors for, uh, for the population. But in fact, medical services provided free to the residents of any district. Uh, true, it might take a month before the doctor to come out and see you, but you didn't have to pay for medicine or hospital treatment if you were an ordinary citizen. And, um, Doctors had a great deal of respect. So it was something uh, you wanted to do. A medical education was also an extremely good preparation for a writer because doctors then were first taught to write. They had to write a history of the patient's uh, disease and the outcome of, of his treatment or her treatment. 
So Tereshenko wrote dozens, we, we've lost most of them, of these uh, little uh, histories of disease. The other thing about writing, of course, was that um, there were then, with the relaxation of the censorship, a lot of new magazines for the newly literate, as Russia's education system was beginning to function properly, and Chekhov could earn a modest five kopecks a line, that's about 15 cents in modern purchasing power, uh, writing for a short sketches and stories, humorous ones, for these weekly papers in Petersburg and in Moscow. That gave him an entry into the bottom end of literary life. But it was a very good discipline because it taught him to be economical. You didn't want your stories to be rejected. You had to be careful about not upsetting the censor. The censorship could be quite strict on moral and political grounds. So it, it, it was a discipline which um, served him all his life. And you often find these early comic stories uh, provide material for his mature work when he becomes a much freer and much more important writer. Well, it looked for a while as if Jeff was going to be a doctor first, writing on the side. But you notice with experience uh, of medicine, uh, as he graduates, he realizes that there are serious problems being a doctor in Russia. One is the high mortality of doctors. They tended to die of whatever their patients were suffering from. Doctors died of cholera, of TB particularly, which Chekhov was going to suffer from all his life. It was going to kill him. Or they di uh, died of typhoid. Uh, they sometimes died of, of uh, misery and, and, and depression. Uh, suicide rate was extremely high. And unless you were a fashionable doctor, if you worked for the state, for the rural district council, you weren't paid that much. So it was a difficult profession. And after the death of a few patients, um, he, he set it aside. Later on, he would treat peasants. Uh, he would treat friends. Very often, he would refuse to treat people, saying that you can't treat old age, or after one illness comes another, well, like the doctors in his plays. So he became more and more uh, um, attached to literature, particularly as he began to attract attention. Uh, people in Petersburg noted the quality of his sketches. He began to be offered more space in more prestigious newspapers, uh, better paid. And by the time he was 26, uh, he could make a living and also support his family. Uh, his family was almost, a, a, he co called it baggage that he had to carry everywhere. And like most writers, he lived with his family his sister all, constantly all his life, his mother virtually all his life, his father till his father died in late 1890s, um, and his brothers constantly, whenever they were broke or desperate, would also come and dump themselves and their offspring uh, on him. So he had this enormous uh, responsibility which kept, kept him writing. Now the early Chekhov, as you can see from these photographs, um, uh, he was quite a handsome man. One doesn't think of this, Chekhov was tall, and despite the TB that he was already nurturing, uh, he, he seemed energetic and, and, and fit. Uh, the, the disease would only sort of dominate him uh, in, the, in the 1890s. He began to attract uh, senior writers. Um, he has no time for his own father, whom he regarded as a tyrant and a, and a bigot. He is attracted very much to older senior men like uh, Alexei Suvorin, uh, the Rupert Murdoch of the day, uh, a very powerful man who had a lot in common with Chekhov, depression, difficult relatives, lowly origins, and uh, a sort of depressed view of life at times. Um, these senior figures saw his talent and uh, pressed him to write something really serious uh, and, to, and to polish his work. And, Finally, it was a, a, a poet called Grigorovich, um, uh, who was already an old man, who, who wrote a long, long letter begging him to stop writing comic stuff and to do something really serious. Uh, and then Chekhov sort of remembered his childhood and wrote a most extraordinary um, uh, story, a story almost without a plot, called The Step, in which a small boy crosses the whole of the Ukraine uh, to get uh, to his a uh, new city where he'll, he'll get his education. Nobody had written anything like this before. Um, you can read the same thing in Catherine Mansfield's story, Prelude, uh, to that same, uh, same movement, uh, uh, seeing will the world through a, through a child. And he showed real genius, and that, that was rewarded. 
Um, at the same time, Chekhov's private life was extraordinarily complicated. The fact that he wrote a play eventually called Three Sisters is, when you look at his life, not at all surprising. There are at least five sets of three sisters, sometimes three sisters for three Chekhov brothers. Uh, most of them fairly bohemian and louche. And uh, in Russia, morals were much freer than they were in, in England, America, or France. Um, there was, um, they'd never really um, reformed after the Napoleonic era. So it was, it was fairly easy to have girlfriends uh, and um, nobody was particularly shocked by whatever ever happened. Uh, his first fiance, who you see on the right, uh, was uh, Dunya Efros. And uh, that is an example of uh, one side of Chekhov that he was uh, very, very pro-Jewish. Taganrok was a city where, where there were a lot of Jews and Jews in his school, Jews in, his, uh, uh, in the university. Unlike most Russian writers, he was pro-Jewish, although he found Dunya Efros a little too Jewish for him, as he, as he said when he broke up with her. That was one, one example, but there are many other girls um, and women. Um, on the left, uh, you see uh, Lydia Avilova, who was an exception uh, in the sense that she was married with two children, and usually Chekhov avoided uh, married women with children. Um, and uh, yes, so uh, the middle one is Olga Kundasova, who was a, a highly intellectual. A uh, woman who often required to, uh, a stay in a psychiatric hospital where she was convinced she was one of the doctors, not one of the patients. Uh, Chekhov was very, very kind to her and um, uh, sort of friendly with her for, for 15 years. Um, and uh, there, there are many examples. The run through the 40 or 50 girlfriends we know about will, will take all evening. Yelena Chavrova is one of three sisters. Uh, interestingly, Chekhov taught her to write. He, he often acted as a mentor and corrected the stories and even turned them in, into writers. Um, uh, he wrote about her that she was a very nice woman but had a very silly hairstyle. Um, the one who stuck it out longest was Lika Mizinova, who fell in love with him her, uh, to the horror of her relatives in the late 1880s and stuck it out for 10 years. She described herself as a piece of cheese you refused to eat. Um, he, he sometimes uh, avoided her, sort of circled right around Switzerland so as not to meet her there. Um, but she was um, extremely beautiful, uh, extremely intelligent, but disorderly. I think one of the secrets of Chekhov uh, as, a, as, a, as a man was that women who attracted him sexually, uh, very often he disliked as persons. His affairs with actresses always went wrong on those grounds. And women whom he respected and liked as people to talk to and admired, it didn't attract him sexually at all. That was a difficult problem, which uh, I don't think would ever, ever have been solved, even though he did in the end get married. Um, so these occupied uh, quite a lot of his life. And it, in fact, probably due to that, that uh, he fled in 1890. Uh, and he made this extraordinary journey to the island of Sakhalin, north of Japan, which was Russia's penal colony, like Britain's uh, Botany Bay or France's Devil Island, were the worst murderers uh, were sent. And Chekhov went there not only to get away from the numerous women who felt they had a claim on him, uh, but also to, to prove to critics that he was not just a, an idle aesthete who pointed out misery, uh, but he was really concerned and was determined to do something about it. He did his best. He, he made this suicidal journey across Siberia when there were no railways, no bridges, freezing temperatures. If you had TB, it was the last thing you wanted to do. He walked around this island, filling in 10,000 questionnaires. Everyone loved him, even the psychopathic guards, as well as the murderers. Uh, and then he came back by ship. But he came back a different man after he'd seen all this misery, uh, the convicts, and um, he never trusted power. He was never a political writer, but you can read things in, into his work that he detested uh, tyranny. Uh, he admired Western democracy, well, not exactly democracy, but parliamentary government, he, which he saw in France when he started traveling to Europe. Um, and he, he believed in, in political progress. Um, he never joined in the political parties, unlike other doctors who did, because doctors were free from persecution, largely in Russia, and could, could make critical remarks about the government and even uh, take part in revolutionary movements without 
Kitty Punish. But after 1890s, uh, he becomes a different man. And then he leaves the city, buys himself an estate. And as long as his health permitted, he became a landowner, someone who knew the peasants, looked after the peasants, got on well with them, uh, but gradually uh, found himself un unable, unable to cope. Now, after me, the, this was the estate of Melikova, uh, as painted by his sister, Masha, who was quite a talented painter. But unfortunately, no book has ever been produced of her paintings. And in this rather simple wooden house, where, which either catching fire or freezing, um, he, he lived for some years. Um, it was only three hours by train to Moscow, so he could keep in touch. And unfortunately for him, visitors could easily come down unannounced and expect to be entertained and, and fed. And he had, to, he had to take measures of building a special house where they, either he could isolate himself or, or uh, uh, get away. You now see his sort of uh, life. He had, he had dogs. He was given by one of his publishers, uh, Dachshunds. And the Dachshund is the only animal, I think, that Chekhov was seen to cuddle in public. Um, very, very fond of his Dachshunds. The peculiar thing is that when he abandoned this estate, he abandoned his Dachshunds and they died uh, horrible deaths uh, of, of neglect. But his TB was so bad that uh, he was actually put in a clinic in 1896 where he was treated by uh, un under the auspices of one of his former teachers who told him he was a cripple now. And the advice then for, there were lots of different advice for people with TB was to go to the Crimea. In the Crimea, you'll see the graves of not only very many patients, but also the doctors who, who treated them there. The winters there are quite severe. In fact, the only thing that ever worked with TB in Russia was drinking fermented mare's milk uh, with the, uh, provided by Tatars between the Volga and the Urals. A Czech was forced to do that after he married, his wife insisted, but he could only put up with that for six weeks before he clearly decided he'd rather die uh, than that. Um, he went to Nice for a year. Um, it's interesting that he spent nearly a year in France, but set, never set a story there, just as he spent a year or two of his life in St. Petersburg and only set one story there. They didn't, uh, didn't inspire him. But Nice too was a place where people came to die. Maupassant calls it the flourishing cemetery of Europe. Um, it, was, it was an impossible situation, that, that, that disease. Well, Chekhov, as a short story writer, became more and more varied, more and more subtle uh, in dealing with uh, situations where you could judge things either way. He developed a method of writing which left out the beginning and left out the end and just concentrated on the middle. So you're not forced to, to accept any conclusions. In that way, he's very different from other Russian writers, which is probably why he's, he, he's so popular. His career as a, as a, as a playwright uh, only really came to life uh, in his last years. Every time he'd written a play before, he swore he'd never do it again. Uh, he'd even leave town and go to another city uh, rather than face the critics' reviews. Uh, simply the theater didn't, didn't understand plays like The Seagull, and they booed it. But two uh, directors, Nemirovich Danchenko and Stanislavski, recognized that this was just the sort of theater they needed, and they found that the Moscow Arts Theater, and they begged Chekhov to let them uh, perform his plays. Now, that tied him in many ways. They forced him to go on writing. If they hadn't forced him, we'd have had no Three Sisters, we'd have had no Cherry Orchard. He kept on making excuses not to write them. There was considerable tension uh, you may remember that Chekhov will call a play a comedy, even though the main hero shoots himself at the end. And uh, Stanislavski was very upset by this. Uh, he was frightened by the cherry orchard when Chekhov said it was going to be a comedy. He said to his sister, Chekhov still thinks that Three Sisters are a very funny little play. Um, but nevertheless, they put on the plays exactly as the author wanted and had enormous success when a Chekhov play was on in Moscow, the streets were jammed with carriages. You couldn't, you couldn't move around the theater. And the theater also had another technique, which I think many modern theaters and certainly Hollywood has, that if they wanted to keep a playwright, they took the best and prettiest actress they had and made sure they introduced her to the playwright in, in this hope that uh, the relationship would become permanent and they would then have a lever. Oh, I must have your play, Anton, for next year. And that is what happened with Olga Knipper. Uh, 
Olga Knippo is an extraordinary woman her way, not the most attractive of, uh, to look at uh, of Chekhov's women friends, but the best organized. She could nurse the sick. Uh, she, could, uh, she, she was very, very capable. She could translate. She could, have, she could be enormously energetic and fun, and she could be very serious. She could be very manipulative too. Um, and uh, she succeeded in manipulating um, all Chekhov's former women friends out, terrifying them uh, with little interviews and um, then telling Chekhov that she couldn't go on with him uh, creeping up the stairs when his mother was in the house uh, without marrying him. And that, that marriage, in fact, not a happy marriage, but Chekhov thought it would work because he wanted a wife who would be not like the sun, but like the moon, not rising every day in my garden. Um, and she worked in Moscow while he uh, suffered in, in, in the Crimea. Um, but it's thanks to her that uh, she maintained this relationship in the theater and Anton Chekhov, and we, we have the great plays that we have, have today. Well, I think I'm overstaying my welcome. I'll just say that Olga Knippa was uh, perhaps um, like his sister, responsible for maintaining his reputation and his estate. And the extraordinary thing is after Chekhov's death and after the revolution, the Chekhov heritage was kept perfectly and looked after not only by Joseph Stalin, but also by Adolf Hitler. Um, Stalin made sure that no Chekhov was arrested. Olga Knipper's brother was a, a, a member of the secret police. And that theatre flourished at a time when theatre directors from all over Russia were either being shot or in the gulag. Um, Chekhov, uh, uh, Stalin read uh, Chekhov stories to his daughter Svetlana. That may have been something with it. And the other fact is that um, Chekhov's uh, nephew, Mikhail, who eventually ended up in, a, in Hollywood, um, uh, had married um, a, 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 another Knipper, an Olga, uh, who became Olga Chekhova. And as Chekhov's nephew was actually the son of a Jew, Natalia Golden, a former girlfriend of, of, uh, of Anton's, uh, that made it very problematic for the family to stay in Germany. And the Germans arranged for a fake certificate to be uh, made in Russia, pointing out that um, Mikhail's mother, Natalia Golden, was in fact Natalia Galdina, and therefore not Jewish. And she could go on. She became Hitler's favorite actress, Olga Chekhova. And when the war ended, she was flown to Moscow. She thought she was going to be sent straight to the Gulag. But uh, Stalin's head of police came up with a ball gown for her and some presents and sent her back to Germany. So the Chekhov heritage was looked at uh, after at, at, the, at the very top. Um, now, of course, uh, Chekhov heritage is a literary one. I don't think it's possible to be a playwright in any language of the world without taking into account Chekhov. Even Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, if you look at it, it's got the same stage instructions. Let's go, they don't move. Let's go, they don't move or a tree that suddenly bursts into leaf and then loses its leaf. Uh, you could take Bernard Shaw's Heartbreak House, which is pure cherry orchard, without the humor, admittedly, but you can see that, uh, that it's not possible. And as for the short story, Catherine Mansfield's best stories are reworkings of Chekhovian themes, almost plagiarism. And in America, John Cheever is inconceivable without, without Chekhov. Uh, he is extraordinarily easy to translate compared with the other writers. His language is, is unambiguous, simple. It's a, it's a lesson in how to write. No surplus adjectives and adverbs, clarity, uh, pacing, and so on. So um, his future is assured, even though you could put all Chekhov's works, major works, into just one thick volume, um, unlike, say, Tolstoy, for whom you have to cater architecturally. I think, I'll, I think I've uh, exhausted my time now, but any questions that come at the end, I'll, I'll be very happy to, to deal with. Yes, thank you, Professor. That was uh, fascinating and a, a quick and thorough study of Chekhov's both life and art. Um, I'm gonna remind the audience now that you can enter your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Um, and that's going to bring us to the first reading of Chekhov's 1894 short story, The Student. Um, Professor, before we begin, I thought maybe you could say a couple of words. I'll just say very little. Uh, this story is one of the shortest, just four or five pages. And a third of that is quotation from the Gospels. 
Um, and um, yet Czech, it's rather like Beethoven's Eighth Symphony. Chekhov said it, it may have been his shortest, but it was his favorite. Um, and it is extraordinary in being just a simple encounter between a student priest and two peasant women, uh, which somehow links with the Easter story uh, in, in the Bible. I'll just say one thing about Russian priests, if you're not a Russian Orthodox, they're different from Catholic priests or Protestant priests. They're closer to the peasants. They, they didn't have a prosperous house. They weren't considered the equal of the gentry. People sort of didn't invite them to sit down when they invited the priests into the house. They had no prospects of promotion, but they had other things. They could trace their ancestry back to St. Peter because in Russia, it's almost impossible to become a priest unless your father is a priest. It's an inherited one. So you could trace it back right all the way. The second thing about priests is, as Chekhov felt, they're like authors. They don't know why. They've got a story to tell. They've got a language to tell it in. It's not their own. But they tell it in church and people burst into tears. There are several Chekhov stories in which this happens. The bishop is perhaps the, the, the most expanded. Um, and he feel, Chekhov seemed to feel that, uh, the, although he was not a believer himself, the priests were, were somehow magical like authors. They don't, didn't know why, but whatever they said ha had an effect, a magical effect. And it, the relation of a priest and congregation is that of writer and, and, and reader. So, um, I think that, that that will be sufficient explanation. Thank you very much, Professor. And now I'm going to turn it over to Beth Gilliland, who will read The Student by Anton Chekhov. First, the weather was fine and still. The thrushes were calling, and in the swamps close by, something alive droned pitifully with a sound like blowing into an empty bottle. A snipe flew by and the shot aimed at it rang out with a gay resounding note in the spring air. But when it began to get dark in the forest, a cold penetrating wind blew inappropriately from the east and everything sank into silence. Needles of ice stretched across the pools and it felt cheerless, remote and lonely in the forest. There was a whiff of winter Ivan Velikopolsky, the son of a sacristan and a student of the clerical academy, returning home from shooting, walked all the time by the path in the winterside meadow. His fingers were numb and his face was burning with the wind. It seemed to him that the cold that had suddenly come on had destroyed the order and harmony of things, that nature itself felt ill at ease. And that was why the evening darkness was falling more rapidly than usual. All around it was deserted and peculiarly gloomy. The only light was one gleaming in the widow's garden near the river. The village over three miles away and everything in the distance all round was plunged into the cold evening mist. The student remembered that as he went out from the house, his mother was sitting barefoot on the floor in the entry cleaning the samovar while his father lay on the stove coughing as it was Good Friday, nothing had been cooked and the student was terribly hungry. And now, shrinking from the cold, he thought that just such a wind had blown in the days of Rurik and in the time of Ivan the Terrible and Peter. And in their time, there had been just the same desperate poverty and hunger, the same thatched roofs with holes in them, ignorance, misery, the same desolation around, the same darkness, the same feeling of oppression, all these had existed, did exist, and would exist, and the lapse of a thousand years would make life no better. And he did not want to go home. The gardens were called the widows because they were kept by two widows, mother and daughter. A campfire was burning brightly with a crackling sound, throwing out light far around on the plowed earth. The widow Vasilisa, a tall, fat old woman in a man's coat, was standing by and looking thoughtfully into the fire. Her daughter Lucuria, a little pockmarked woman with a stupid looking face, was sitting on the ground washing a cauldron and spoons. Apparently they had just had supper. There was a sound of men's voices. It was the laborers watering their horses at the river. 
Here you have winter back again, said the student going up to the campfire. Good evening. Vasilisa started, but at once recognized him and smiled cordially. I did not know you, God bless you, she said. You'll be rich. They talked. Vasilisa, a woman of experience who had been in service with the gentry, first as a wet nurse, afterwards as a children's nurse, expressed herself with refinement and a soft, sedate smile never left her face. Her daughter, Lucuria, a village peasant woman who had been crushed by her husband, screwed up her eyes simply at the student and said nothing. And she had a strange expression, like that of a deaf mute. At such a fire, the apostle Peter warmed himself, said the student, stretching out his hands to the fire. So it must have been cold then too. Oh, what a terrible night it must have been, Granny. An utterly dismal long night. He looked round at the darkness, shook his head abruptly and asked, no doubt you have been at the reading of the 12 gospels? Yes, I have, answered Vasilisa. If you remember at the last supper, Peter said to Jesus, I am ready to go with thee into darkness and unto death. And our Lord answered him thus, I say unto thee, Peter, before the cock croweth, thou wilt have denied me thrice. After the supper, Jesus went through the agony of death in the garden and prayed, and poor Peter was weary in spirit and faint. His eyelids were heavy, and he could not struggle against sleep. He fell asleep. Then you heard how Judas the same night kissed Jesus and betrayed him to his tormentors. They took him bound to the high priest and beat him, while Peter, exhausted, worn out with misery and alarm, hardly awake, you know, feeling that something awful was just going to happen on earth followed behind. He loved Jesus passionately, intensely, and now he saw from far off how he was beaten. Lucuria left the spoons and fixed an immovable stare upon the student. They came to the high priests, he went on. They began to question Jesus. And meantime, the laborers made a fire in the yard as it was cold and warmed themselves. Peter too stood with them near the fire and warmed himself as I am doing. A woman seeing him said, he was with Jesus too. That is to say that he too should be taken and questioned. And all the laborers that were standing near the fire must have looked sourly and suspiciously at him because he was confused and said, oh, I, I don't know him. A little while after again, someone recognized him as one of Jesus' disciples and said, thou too art one of them. But again, he denied it. And for the third time, someone turned to him. Why did I not see thee with him in the garden today? For the third time. He denied it. And immediately after that time, the cock crowed. And Peter, looking from afar off at Jesus, remembered the words he had said to him in the evening. He remembered, he came to himself, went out of the yard and wept bitterly, bitterly. In the gospel it is written, he went out and wept bitterly. I imagine it, the still, still, dark, dark garden, and in the stillness, faintly audible, smothered, sobbing. The student sighed and sank into thought. Still smiling, Vasilisa suddenly gave a gulp. Big tears flowed freely down her cheeks, and as she screened her face from the fire with her sleeve as though ashamed of her tears, and, Lu and Lucuria, staring immovably at the student, flushed crimson, and her expression became strained and heavy, like that of someone enduring intense pain. The laborers came back from the river, and one of them riding a horse was quite near, and the fire from the light quivered upon him. The student said good night to the widows and went on, and again the darkness was about him and his fingers began to be numb. A cruel wind was blowing. Winter really had come back, and it did not feel as though Easter would be the day after tomorrow. Now the student was thinking about Vasilisa. Since she had shed tears, 
all that had happened to Peter the night before the crucifixion must have some relation to her. He looked round. The solitary light was still gleaming in the darkness and no figures could be seen it near it now. The student thought again that if Vasilisa had shed tears and her daughter had been troubled, it was evident that what he had just been telling them about, which had happened 19 centuries ago, had a relation to the present, to both women, to the desolate village, to himself, to all people. The old woman had wept, not because he could tell the story touchingly, but because Peter was near to her, because her whole being was interested in what was passing in Peter's soul. And suddenly joy stirred in his soul and he even stopped for a minute to take breath. The past, he thought, is linked with the present by an unbroken chain of events flowing one out of another. And it seemed to him that he had just seen both ends of that chain, that when he touched one end, the other quivered. When he crossed the river by the ferry boat and afterwards mounting the hill, looked at his village and toward the west where the cold purple sunset lay a narrow streak of light, he thought that truth and beauty which had guided human life there in the garden and in the yard of the high priest had continued without interruption to this day and had evidently always been the chief thing in human life and in all earthly life indeed. And the feeling of youth, health, vigor, he was only 22, and the inexpressible sweet expectation of happiness, of unknown mysterious happiness, took possession of him little by little. And life seemed to him enchanting, marvelous, and full of lofty meaning. Beth, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, now that we've resolved some tech issues, and before I bring in Professor Rayfield again to uh, kind of give us some color commentary and set up the next story, I'd like to invite everybody to type into the chat box the city and the country that they are, uh, are watching us from today and participating from. We've got some terrific uh, questions so far and looking forward to getting to those at the Q&A. Um, let's see, I think, uh, Professor Rayfield, are you able to uh, get back on for us? Okay, I guess not. Our technical problems continue. Well, welcome to 2021, I guess, <laughs> the age of Zoom. So Beth, I think we will move on to our next story, the night before the trial. We're in for bad luck, sir, said the driver, turning around and pointing with the whip to a hare running across the road. I knew without this evil omen that my future was desperate, for I was going to the neighboring court to be tried for bigamy. The weather was as bad as it possibly could be. When at last I reached the station where I was to spend the night, I was covered with snow and felt as though I had been well flogged, so wet, cold, and numb was I from the monotonous shaking of the old cart. At the station, I was met by the station master, a tall, rather sleepy looking man in blue striped trousers. He was bald and had a mustache apparently growing out of his nostrils, which might have deadened his sense of smell for smells there were a plenty, I can assure you. When the station master, grumbling, sniffing, and scratching the back of his head, opened the door and without a word pointed his elbow at the place I was to settle for that night, I smelled the odor of sealing wax and of something else so very acrid that I almost choked. A tin lamp standing on a table smoldered and barely lit the unpainted wooden wall. There's an awful smell in here, mister, said I walking in and putting my traveling bag down on the table. The station master took a deep breath and shook his head. Smells as it usually does, said he and scratched his head. It only seems so to you because you came in from the frost. <laughs> 
I sent the man away and began to examine my temporary dwelling. The sofa on which I had to sleep was very broad, like a double bed, and was covered with an oil cloth as cold as ice. Besides the sofa, there was a big iron stove, the table with the lamp I mentioned, someone's felt boots, a satchel, and a screen, which partitioned off one corner. Behind the screen, someone was quietly sleeping. Having looked about, I made my bed and began to undress. My nose soon got used to the smell. I took off my coat, trousers, and boots. Then, in order to get warm, I jumped around the stove, lifting my bare legs very high. I soon felt a little warmer. The only thing left for me to do then was stretch out on the sofa and fall asleep. But at that moment, something peculiar occurred. My gaze suddenly felt on the corner where the screen stood. Imagine my utter amazement when from behind the screen, I saw a woman's head with loose hair, black eyes, and a wide smile. Her dark eyebrows moved. Her cheeks dimpled as though she was laughing. I was embarrassed. Observing that I saw her, she too became embarrassed and hid herself. I lay down on the sofa and covered myself with the coat. I felt that I was responsible for the incident. How awful, I thought to myself. She must have seen me jump. That's not nice. And recollecting the features of her sweet face, I involuntarily began to dream. Pictures exceeding one another in beauty and enticement crowded my imagination and as though to punish me for my sinful thoughts, pain on my right cheek. I touched it and though I felt nothing, I guessed what the trouble was. What am I to do? I heard the woman's voice say just then. Those nasty bed bugs, they really want to devour me. I remembered my good habit of taking Keating's powder with me whenever I traveled. I hadn't forgotten to pack it this time. In a second, the tin box with the powder was pulled out of the valise. I had only to offer the remedy to the owner of the sweet face and in this way, get acquainted. But how was I to offer it? It's awful, I heard her exclaim again. Madam, said I in a very low voice, I understand that from your last exclamation, that you have been being annoyed by bed bugs. Um, I have some Keating's power powder. If you desire, I, yes, please. At once, I shall put on my coat and bring it. No, no, you can hand it to me over the screen, only don't come here. Certainly I shall hand it over the screen. Don't be afraid, I am no boozy tramp. Who can tell? You're a stranger here. Well, and if I went behind the screen, there would be nothing wrong in that. Besides, I am a doctor. I invented it on the spur of the moment. And doctors, police inspectors, and ladies hairdressers are permitted to intrude upon privacy. Uh, are you really a doctor? Seriously? Upon my word. Will you allow me then to bring you the powder? Well, if you are a doctor, please. Only, why should you trouble? I, I can send my husband out to you. She hesitated a moment and then called in a sort of loud whisper. Fadia, wake up, you seal. Get up and go out behind the screen. The doctor has been so kind as to offer us some Keating's powder. The news that there was a Fadia behind the screen startled me. My soul was filled with as much disappointment as the trigger of a gun probably feels when it suddenly misfires, ashamed, vexed, and sorry. I felt stunned. And such a scoundrel did this Fadia appear to me when he came out from behind the screen that I almost cried out for help. Fadia was a tall, sinewy man about 50 years old with gray whiskers, tightly closed lips, and little blue veins all over his nose and temples. 
He was in a dressing gown and slippers. You are very kind, doctor, said he, taking the Keating's powder from me and returning behind the screen. Thanks. Are you also being annoyed by bedbugs? Yes, said I, lying down on the sofa again and furiously drawing the coat over myself. Yes, indeed. Then I heard him address his wife. Zinochka, there's a bed bug running on your little nose. Let me take it off. Do, laughed Zinochka. Then she exclaimed, you didn't catch it. And you, a state counselor. Everybody is afraid of you, yet you can't even get the better of a bed bug. Hush, Zinochka. Don't forget there's a stranger here. You always say things you shouldn't. The beasts, they won't let you sleep, I grumbled angrily, not knowing why. The couple soon dozed off. I closed my eyes and tried not to think of anything in order to fall asleep myself. Half an hour passed, then an hour, but still, I could not sleep. At last, my neighbors began to fidget about and scold each other in a whisper. It's strange. Even the Keating's powder doesn't do any good, grumbled Fabia. There are so many of them. Then he called to me. Doctor, Zinochka told me to ask you why the bed bugs smell so bad. We started talking to each other. We spoke about the bugs, the weather, the Russian winter, medicine, of which I had as little knowledge as of astronomy. We also spoke of Edison. Then I heard him admonish his wife gently. Don't be ashamed, Zinochka. He's a doctor. Don't be shy, ask. There's nothing to be afraid of. Dr. Sheratsov didn't help and perhaps this one will. Ask him yourself, whispered Zinochka. Doctor, said Fadia, addressing me. Why has my wife such a pain in her chest? She coughs, you know, and, and feels such a weight on her chest as though, as though there was something clotted there. That would require a long explanation and can't be answered in a few words, said I, trying to get out of it. What does it matter if it's a long explanation? There's plenty of time. We are not sleeping anyway. Please examine her, my dear fellow. I must tell you that Dr. Sheratsov treated her and he's a good man, but I don't believe much in what he says. No, I don't. But I, I see that you would not be deposed as he is, disposed as he is to give us a diagnosis that's too favorable. I do wish you would examine her and I shall go meanwhile to the station master and order the samovar to be set. Fadia, shuffling with his slippers left the room. I went behind the screen. Zinochka sat on a broad sofa surrounded by many pillows holding up her lace collar. Show me your tongue, said I, sitting beside her and knitting my brows. She showed me her tongue and began to laugh. Her tongue was as it should be, red. I felt her pulse. Hmm, I muttered, though I really couldn't find it. I don't remember what other questions I put to her smiling face. I only remember that at the end of my examination, I felt such a fool that I really couldn't ask any more questions. Fadia returned. The three of us were having tea. I wrote a prescription and as I composed it professional and I composed it as professionally as I knew how. Seek transit, Gloria Mundi, aqua distillate, a tablespoon every two hours, Dr. Zaitsev. In the morning, when I was ready to depart, I stood with my traveling bag in my hand, taking leave of my new acquaintances whom I thought never to meet again. Fadia buttonholed me and, and persuaded me to accept a 10 ruble bill. No, you must take it, he said. I always pay for honest work. You studied, worked, I understand. Your knowledge was attained by the sweat of your brow. There was nothing I could do but take the money. Thus, I spent the night previous to my trial. <laughs>
I shall not describe the emotions I experienced when the door was opened and the court attendant pointed out to me the section reserved for defendants. I turned pale and got confused. Looking around, I saw a thousand eyes gazing at me. I seemed to hear my own death knell. I looked at the serious and important faces of the jury. I can neither describe nor can you imagine my terror when, looking up at the table which was covered with red cloth, I saw in the prosecutor's place, whom do you think? Thadia. He was writing. When I looked at him, I remembered the bed bugs, Zinochka, my prescription, and I not only felt a frost, but the whole Arctic Ocean on my spine. Having finished writing, Fadia looked at me. At first, he did not recognize me, but afterwards he opened his eyes wide, his lower jaw hung down, his hand shook. He got up slowly and shot an icy look at me. I too got up, not knowing why, and stared back at him. Defendant, tell the court your name, occupation, etc. the bailiff began. The prosecutor drank some water and sat down. His forehead was covered in perspiration. Here's a fine kettle of fish, I thought. I could see the prosecutor meant to have revenge on me. He was very irritated and again and again, he looked over the written evidence and grumbled. But now it's time to finish. I'm writing this in the building of the court during dinner recess. Directly after this, the prosecutor will speak. Oh Lord, what will he say? Beth, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, you were amazing in bringing Chekhov's words from the page to life for us. Um, Professor, are you back? Can you turn on your uh, video? I can't get my video on. It says the host has stopped it. Oh, Lucian, can you uh, bring to start. Uh, Professor Rayfield's video, please? In the meantime, um, we're going to start moving towards our audience Q&A. And so I'm going to ask you to uh, type your questions and comments for our speakers into the Q&A or the chat box. And um, while they come in, I'd like to thank the board and members of the Russian American Business and Culture Council, and especially Dr. Mila Eklund and Lucian O'Brien. Their energy and ideas and Lucian's technical expertise have made this program possible. I also want to invite our audience to learn more about our ABCC to subscribe to our free newsletter, and maybe to become a member by visiting our website, rabcc.org. RABCC members automatically receive event invitations to public live and virtual events like this one. They also have access to private member only events and small group discussions with experts and professionals like Professor Rayfield and Ms. Gilliland. And for those of you who are uh, asking questions in the chat box, they also have access to slideshows and images that we prepare for events like this. So with that, I think we can uh, see if we can move into some questions and some answers. Or before we move into questions and answers, uh, Professor, I wanted to ask you if you had any follow-up to the two stories that you wanted well, um, to discuss. The, the student is mature Chekhov, very subtle. You can take it optimistically or pessimistically as you like. Uh, whereas uh, Night Before the Trial is actually typical of uh, Chekhov's early comic writing. It's quite conventional, the story of a man who pretends to be a doctor because he thinks he can seduce a married woman and then comes horribly unstuck. That, that's in Moliere's comedies. Uh, actually, that story was a little too much for the censor. They regarded it as encouraging adultery. So it took him over a year to get it into print. But he obviously quite liked it because he spent some time turning it into a little play, which never got published. But um, it's one of his best early comic works, 
But you can see if he died in 1884, after writing that, not many people would know about Chekhov. Um, but it is a contrast with the, I mean, it's very skillfully done as a piece of comic writing, but uh, compared with the later stuff, it's, it's, it's minor. Great, um, thank you for that. Um, any other remarks? I know we're running a little bit over on time, but uh, Beth and, and Professor Rayfield have agreed to stay on for the question and answer session for pleasure. another pleasure. few minutes or so. They've kindly done that. Um, Shall I take the Q and A's, the written ones, and I'll answer them live? Would that be? Yeah, I'll I will, I'll read them to you. Uh, some of the ones that have come in. Um, the first one is called is from John Hordner, and it says, "Was Chekhov called a psychologist? How did his observations stand up to what early psychologists were saying?" How did his? How did his observations and his writings? Um, compare or stand up to what early psychologists were saying? Well, uh, Chekhov was uh, active long before uh, psychology and psychiatry became a science in Russia. Uh, and I think he had the, um, the basic qualification of a psychologist was that he talked very little and listened very patiently. Um, and his, he didn't believe in complexes, uh, or at least he if he did, he didn't believe there's anything you could do about them, but he did urge people to do as they uh, follow their instincts and not let themselves be stopped by any so-called morality or, or um, uh, inhibitions. Um, when you look at him as a med medical student, uh, he was very impressive as, first of all, a psychologist, that he understood what people were thinking. Secondly, he was horrifically good as a diagnostician uh, when he wanted a country cottage, he would look at who was the present tenant, look at him carefully, and then go to the landlord and said, I'll book that cottage for next year because that tenant isn't going to be alive in a year's time. And um, he was probably an extremely good gynecologist. Um, he, uh, Russia had an unusual number of women doctors, uh, more than Britain, more than anywhere except New Zealand and the United States. But women uh, certainly felt that Chekhov was, uh, was the one doctor they could talk to freely. I don't think he was particularly good as a surgeon um, or even a general practitioner. But um, psychologists in knowing how people thought and how they would react, be able to predict behavior. I don't think he had any theories. Um, psychology really wasn't yet uh, developed. Great. Thank you. Um, also, another question. Um, how, how do you feel that, uh, what are Chekhov's main differences from writers like Tolstoy or Dostoevsky? What are the innovations that he brought as well as the differences? Uh, he was not a religious thinker or religious propagandist, uh, unlike Dostoevsky or Tolstoy. He had no strong positive political views or political experience like either of them. He didn't fight the government, he didn't fight the church. The only political stand he took was in asserting that the French uh, Captain Dreyfus, the Jew accused of treason was innocent. And he was prepared to break off friendships to defend that and to resign from the academy over it. Um, the main thing is brevity. Uh, he, people constantly asked him to write a novel, a long novel, and he always refused. And he said, I, I can't do plots and I can't do denouements just as I don't know how to tie up my shoelaces or untie them. I just know the middle. Um, he actually did write one novel, but it was a spoof novel, um, a detective story in which it turns out the, the newspaper that published it, the editor was the murderer. Um, so he wasn't asked to do another one. Um, the other thing is I, uh, that um, he doesn't have this, uh, this uh, faith that Dostoevsky and uh, Tolstoy and, and even Turgenev had of that the peasant is the real Russian who will save Russia. I think if you own peasants, as Tolstoy and Turgenev had, uh, or even Dostoevsky's father owned peasants, you feel guilty. And very few writers, as a result of that, hate peasants and feel they're going to take their revenge. But most felt that they owed them something, that they should bow down before the peasant and uh, Chekhov had no illusions about peasant culture, peasant beliefs. Uh, he knew what peasants could be like. 
he, he, as a doctor, he knew that peasants were murdering doctors because they were convinced that they were spreading cholera um, during the cholera, cholera epidemic. So he, he lacks those, those belief systems. He's not particularly interested in complicated plots or in history. He never wrote a historical uh, piece. So in that way, he hasn't got any of the background of the Russian gentry, uh, with that extraordinary burden of guilt, that uh, feeling of needing to atone for something. Um, he belongs more to, a, I would say, a French school. He's much influenced by Maupassant uh, of art, where the important thing about writing is to write well and not to inflict your opinions on the reader. So in a negative way, he's extremely different. In some ways, he's like Turgenev in the, in the, the the device of a Czech play, there are some Russian critics who are sane in all other respects, but who say that Czech's plays are rubbish. There was never anything like the cherry orchard, not possible. And the problem with Czech, he wasn't a landowner, so he didn't understand landed estates. But, uh, or they say that all Czech plays are the same. Some visitors come from town to visit their country relatives and they wreck their lives and then they go away again. True. And Turgenev invented that plot. Turgenev's month in the country has the same check of elements. An older woman competing with a younger woman for the attention of a younger man, a doctor who observes but doesn't do anything to help, an estate that is in, in, a st in ruins, and the whole event happens in a summer, ending with wrecked lives. Uh, so I suppose he did steal that from Turgenev. But apart from Turgenev, I don't think you can um, uh, say he is either borrowing from earlier Russian writing or re rebelling against it. He found the dust, he read Dostoevsky and he found it rather boring, too long. Uh, he did like Anna Karenina, but he liked her for the heroine, not for the plot. Mm. Interesting. And he thought uh, Tolstoy understood nothing about, he was amazed, here's a man who's been married for 40 years, has had uh, caused 13 pregnancies, and he doesn't know the most elementary thing about women. Um, <laughs> so, um, he was very polite to Tolstoy. He revered him as a, as a man of great moral courage, but he had no time for Tolstoy's ideas or his prejudices. Um, another question uh, is the role of nature in his writing, because you just mentioned Turgenev. And yes, so that, that's something just one a quick have few a words about that. Uh, the key event, I think, for, uh, for Chekhov was um, when he left uh, school to go to university. The south of Russia was called the Switzerland of the Don. I don't know if you've ever been to the River Don Basin, but um, shortly after that, a Welshman called Hughes came and chopped down all the trees and turned it into coal mines. It's still the hideous result, destruction of nature. And when Chekhov went back to Taganrog by train, he saw the, the, the forests and steppes, the landscapes, and he was completely destroyed. And he wrote a number of stories all about the destruction of nature. And it makes him a green before any other writer was green, that the most important thing was to keep forests going, to keep rivers clean, to keep the lives. The, the, uh, there's a long speeches in Uncle Vanya about that, the, the whole ethos of the cherry orchard. So he's well ahead of his time in believing that preservation of nature is more important than the organization of society or the welfare of human beings. Um, and he was a gardener of considerable talent. Melikova, you can't see what he planted now. It's been dug up and messed around so much. But the Yalta garden uh, is exactly as Chekhov planned it. His sister complained when he carefully planted out all these exotic shrubs that he'd imported from France. The seed. Chekhov's bedside reading was seed catalogues, not other people's writing. Mm. And now these trees have reached their maturity. You can see that he was a really talented gardener. And you might think the secret to Chekhov's stories is the plot line is like a garden. The whole point about a garden is you enter it and you wander around the paths and then you, in the end, find yourself at the exit, exactly where you began. And you could say a Chekhov story works that way. It doesn't take you somewhere new, it takes you back to where you began, but you've had an experience and a, you've got an understanding you didn't have before. So I think gardening is, is absolutely key. And he uses gardens, uh, the, the Black Monk, for instance, and the Cherry Orchard as a symbol of Russia. It's all being chopped down, all in decay. Uh, a garden has to be run by a tyrant. But unfortunately, once the tyrant goes, the whole thing falls, falls apart. So yes, nature is extremely important. 
and he knew it. He Chekhov's flowers come out at the right time, unlike um, unlike Tolstoy's or Turgenev's. He's got the right birds. As you can read all Dostoevsky, I can't think of a single tree or bird in Dusty in the whole of Dostoevsky. Oh, I think there's a lilac bush in Brother Skaramazov. That's about it. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, one from Frida Fuchs, I think, and that might be yes. from Russia. That's very interesting, that one. Because Stalin yeah. did select who was going to live and who was going to die. And uh, the Moscow Art Theatre was clearly marked out to survive. Um, even though uh, Olga Knipper and uh, others had taken it to America in the early 20s, and usually people who'd been abroad when they got back to Stalin's Russia were in trouble. But it, it was permeated by secret police, but it was a Politburo resort. They wanted to see a good play regularly, just as the, um, uh, the Bolshoi Ballet was also a sort of a private reserve for the Politburo. And very few people from either institution ever ended up in the Gulag. Um, and so there, there were certain writers that started liked um, unexpectedly, for instance, Dostoevsky's Devils, which we thought was the most anti-Stalin work. Stalin had it specially produced for himself in 1933, and the Chekhovs. Uh, in the case of Hitler, it wasn't Hitler so much as Goebbels. Goebbels loved actresses in every sense of the word. There are pictures of uh, che Chekhov's nephew's wife, the other Olga Chekhova, niece of Olga Chekhov. Chekhov's wife, uh, sitting, uh, sitting close to Goebbels and Hitler. And she was undoubtedly a great actress. Um, and um, the Germans made a sort of, um, in, in her favor, they uh, not only procured a certificate to point out that uh, her husband ha had no Jewish blood, but um, they also sent a very nice major, a major backer to the Crimea, when the Germans were occupying the Crimea, to live with Maria Chekhova, Chekhov's sister, and make sure the house was in good order. She had plenty of firewood and food. Um, so it's unusual. In other senses, Hitler didn't care who he killed. Because Chekhov's first fiancée, Dunya Efros, was taken from an old folks' home and gassed by the Germans. Um, I don't think Hitler cared one way or the other. It was just a mechanical exercise. But in the case of um, Chekhov, there was an exception. The Russians today say, oh, well, Olga Chekhova, the, the, the wife of Chekhov's nephew, was actually spying for the, for, the, for the Russians. I don't think she was. I think she, because she was a Chekhov, they decided to overlook her closeness to, to the Nazis. Great. Thank you. I think we'll have uh, time for one more question. Um, and it is from Nick Hayes, who says, would Professor Rayfield comment on Chekhov's influence on film? In this case, his influence on the films of Nikita Mikhalkov. That's something I'm not really qualified to comment on. Nikita Mikhalkov, um, I honestly say I, I rather dislike. I'm sorry about that, it's a fault in my taste. Um, I like some of his smaller things, uh, the film uh, Urga, where about the lorry driver who drives into the only lake in Mongolia. But uh, his big films, no, I can't. I can't see if there's anything Jehovian in, in them. I, I, the films I couldn't sit and watch. Well, here's a good one to end on then. Um, Trudy Campbell asks, which English language translator do you that. feel is most true to Chekhov's original writing? Who do you recommend? Uh, oh, uh, sorry, as a translator? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, depends if you're British or American. Uh, so Rob, we have two languages. That I've experienced when I've written books that are published in America or translated for an American publisher. Um, and there still is no American British dictionary. Um, I would say the, the one published in Britain by, by Penguin in three volumes, the latest one, Wilkes, is extremely good. W I L K E S. And the other thing, perversely, I would say, is one of the earliest ones, Constance Garnett, who uh, produced her pretty well complete Chekhov by 1922. Her knowledge of Russian was so bad that when she went to Russia, she didn't understand a word and nobody understood her. Uh, she was taught by a Russian anarchist and before he'd finished teaching her, he got run over by a train in London. So he was pushed over by the Tsarist secret police. But Constance Garnett was a real writer, a great writer. And um, what I've done once in the past is to, 
go through her translations, correct the actual mistakes. She makes very elementary mistakes like uh, broken pottery, Chiripki, she translates to skulls, um, Chiripa, um, lots of those mistakes. Uh, on the other hand, they're easy to correct. It's just a matter of there weren't any good dictionaries, there weren't enough Russian emigres in Britain with good enough English to help, but her, her flow is so good and uh, she was actually the mother of a very good short story writer. Um, so I would say Constance Garnet, who's in all the second-hand shops, is surprisingly good, uh, especially if you uh, go through it with a pen and a, a dictionary. Um, thank you, thank you very there's much. There's the Jacob too by Ronald Hingley, which is good. But uh, America has its own translators who don't get sold in Britain because when we see American words, in a translation from French or Russian, it sort of shocks you, jolts you. You're suddenly taken away out of Europe. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Sure. And um, we appreciate that. We uh, are going to have to bring our program to a close. We hope that uh, you, our panelists, and our audience enjoyed it. Um, before you go, I would encourage our audience to leave a note for our speakers. Um, you know, in the chat box about, you know, the program in general or about their work in particular. And on behalf of RABCC, I want to give our great thanks to Professor Rayfield for his brilliant scholarship and insights. And that was my- I'll, I'll just say, if anyone would like to email me with these questions I haven't answered, I'll try and give a short answer to each of them. Great. And then we also want to thank Professor uh, Beth Gilliland for, for her wonderful voice talent. That was terrific. I so enjoyed the readings. Yep, so did I. And then also to our co-sponsors, the Museum of Russian Art, Global Minnesota, and Russian Media of Minnesota. And most of all, I want to thank everybody in the audience for coming here today and joining in this celebration of Anton Chekhov. Um, a few words of my own at the end. The beauty of his words and, and work really help us connect with and and I think laugh at our human follies and frailties, but they also connect us with the spirituality of, of nature and the potential spirituality and justness in ourselves and our, in our fellow human beings, I think warts and all. And our ABCC's mission is to foster connections and understanding of those things across cultures. Um, I think we believe that if enough of us look for and choose beauty, truth and justice, both in ourselves and in each other, and if we do it together in common cause, then we can help bring everyone else forward with us. So with that, we're gonna sign off with a painting by the great Russian landscape artist, Isaac Levitan, who was perhaps Anton's best frenemy and also with a lesser known, but very fitting Chekhov quote. And with that, we'll close and say, Spasiba and do svidaniya. До свидания, всего хорошего всем. До свидания.